For the next hour, we hunkered down inside the station and listened as the stronger creatures tore Martin's body apart like it was a chew toy. Cuny insisted we cover the monitor so we didn't have to see the carnage play out. Still, with each passing moment, the rain pelted the building. The wind howled, and then at last, it was over. In the morning light, we gathered to give the cameraman a small vigil. I wanted to go out and see if anything was left to bury, but Olivia said it still wasn't safe. So instead, we gathered some of the corpses of our enemies and made a bonfire in the garage. None of the crew really had much to say. It was just a moment of silence. I didn't know him well, but I had to admire and honor his sacrifice. Some of what he said still lingered in my head, and as Jim bandaged the wounds I had gotten on my arm, I reflected on those words. What did he mean when he said he was part of them now? He whispered. Lasher gave me a look, but didn't respond. I turned to the others for an answer, and Olivia muttered, He was infected. I nodded, recalling that that was the reason her father had been reluctant to even help the cameraman, but still didn't answer my question. The signal didn't hurt them either. What was up with that? Is it really the time for these questions? She sighed irritably. What? It's distracting me. That's how I cope. I said as I watched Jim finish the last of the wrapping. Nobody said a word, so I decided to turn the topic back to retrieving his body. It isn't right for us to just leave him out there to rot, I insisted. It's what he would want, Caleb commented. You can turn off the broadcast, Jim. You're done hunting for now, Kearney remarked. What provoked them anyway? Caleb rolled his eyes. Oh, I don't know. How about the fact that you snagged one and then brought it back here? I felt my mouth go dry again and had nothing to say. I had feared that was the case, but hadn't wanted to be confronted with those facts. We made it out of town. We were in the clear, I said. Told you they would track for miles. But this is more than that, Pruitt. You took what was theirs. We only acted on instinct to get it back, the older Kenny remarked. Natalie was doing her best not to cry, both of us feeling like fools for endangering everyone with our foolish behavior. What are these things anyway? I said. Kearney sighed and lit a Marlboro. Think of them like a colony of ants or bees. They act as one, using frequencies that help them coordinate, strategize, and ultimately attack, he explained. A colony. So... The ones we've seen so far, they're the drones? Kearney nodded and gestured towards the dim light that peeked through the shattered windows. And the soldiers. That's why they aren't harmed by the signal. They're on a different frequency, one we haven't quite figured out how to interfere with yet. You're telling me that this whole time you've been here, you've never dealt with this before? Yeah, you gotta bring all the bad luck, Caleb said with a sneer. Seriously, though, it can't be a coincidence. The hunter gave a long sigh. Of course it isn't, you dipshit. And if you haven't been so dense to go play the hero, then maybe you could have given us more time to explain the shitstorm you signed up for. I'm not the one who is ready to give up on Martin. I snapped, rising to my feet. I saw Natalie growing more emotional as Caleb snarled. Oh yeah, because great job saving him. A lot of good that did, huh? Sounds to me like you just feel guilty for not doing shit. Caleb bounded across the room, staring me right in the eyes. You know what? You've been nothing but trouble since you got here. Enough! Kearney snapped. The hunter gave me an icy glare and backed down as the older man grabbed his crutch and walked towards the center of the room. Dylan did what any of us would have done, what all of us should have done, he said as he finished his smoke. I gave him a nod. I appreciate that, especially coming from you. Tried your best and you failed. I think the guilt alone will be enough to make you second guess the next time you want to disobey an order. Kearney said evenly. There was another moment of awkward silence. Caleb stood up and stretched and muttered, Well, I appreciate that we've all decided to let bygones be bygones. Do you need to focus on our next step? Beacon. I felt too tired to fight, so instead focused my attention on this turn in the conversation. 
She mentioned that before. What is it? Caleb looked at me again, clearly not wanting to share anything with me. He gestured to Jim before remarking, Let the man who designed it explain. Lasher smiled nervously, then turned on one of the monitors and displayed a radar of the surrounding area. Okay, so... You know how we explain that these things are like bees, right? Well, a while back, Martin and I theorized that maybe if we build a type of transponder, we could mess with their signal, control the way they move. Well, the beacon was exactly that. We built it to send out a matching signal to one that we recorded whenever storms rolled in, and... If these past few days have been any indicator, it looks like it's working and the storms are becoming more frequent. Wait, wait, hold on. I don't understand. Are you saying that you actually want the storms to come here? We've been tracking them for years, Pruitt. Monitored their patterns and determined how they operate. For the past four years, our goals have shifted to one singular objective, Mr. Kearney said, as he gave a wicked smirk. Find out where they originate from and knock out the colony. It took me a moment to process all of what they had just said when I sat down on the back end of the weather van. A few things still weren't adding up. Why did we go out and snag one of them, then? What was that for? The beacon can only transmit one way, Jim explained, and when he saw my confused expression, he grabbed some paper and cleared off one of the desks. Okay, so imagine that this coffee cup is us, okay? He said as he grabbed a few other items nearby. Now, this donut here is the transponder, sending out a signal, causing the storm to form one cohesive and predictable pattern. He paused, drawing a ring around the two objects. So in order for us to receive that message, you would need something to coordinate with, which is where the probe came in. Martin sent one out when we were hit by that first storm, and the plan was for it to lead us back to the nest, he explained. I nodded, the pieces starting to form a complete picture, as I stared at the makeshift map that he had made. But the creature died, so you lost signal. No transmission received, so you couldn't pinpoint where the creatures were coming from. Precisely. Jim said, surprised that I caught on so quickly. I shook my head and looked towards Kearney. How can you even be sure there's a nest? You've been doing this since your daughter was little. What makes you think you even have a chance of stopping it? The old man gave me a stern glare, but it was actually Caleb that answered the question. Because if we don't, Eventually, something will happen to all of us, the way it did to everyone else that found this place. Channel 46 will go dark, and when that happens, the whole world will go to shit. I shook my head in disbelief. You're talking about hunting down a force of nature like it's a wild animal. It just doesn't sound possible. Oh, do you suddenly think you know better? Caleb snarled as he pointed towards Natalie, who was still standing dazed in the corner and added, you know, I remind you what happened last time you acted on your own. At least I did something. All you care about is this stupid hunt, like you, you think it's a big game trophy or something. You watch your tone. I'm sorry, does someone have a guilty conscience? That was the last straw for the hunter. He punched me square in the jaw before I had a chance to react. He was slamming his foot on my chest. I heard Olivia and Natalie asking him to stop, but Mitchum wasn't listening. His anger towards me had finally reached a boiling point. Then, just as he was about to hit me in the face again, he heard a low growl from outside. Caleb paused, and all of us looked towards the covered-up monitors. They're still out there, Natalie said nervously. Move the blankets, Jim, let's see, Kearney instructed, as Olivia helped me off the ground. All of us watched in stunned silence at one of the exterior monitors when we saw what remained of Martin's body. The drones had torn off both of his arms and devoured the majority of his chest cavity. But most of his face was still hanging on along with the other vital organs, just snagging off the side like discarded trash. Natalie held her mouth and screamed softly as we saw something move in the tree line. It was one of the monsters. It had discarded its human flesh and stretched itself to full size, towering over Martin's body like a bear. In another moment, it used its long pincers to drag his body into the woods leaving the forest floor empty at last. Jim turned to comfort the blonde as she continued to grieve. After another uneasy silence, I asked the question that must have been on everyone's mind. Why would they take his body? Kearney didn't respond. 
but Caleb was checking the radar again. Flashes of activity could be seen miles north. I think they're taking him to the nest. Let me see, the old man said. His interest suddenly peaked at the possibility that they still had a chance to find whatever prize he sought to claim. Could it be? Could be. It's hard to say. We don't have a good signal here. Too much interference from the tower. But if we got out to the transponder, we could track them easily from there. As long as we didn't lose the signal here, we could triangulate it, then broaden our range. You really think that'll work? Olivia said with a surprise. Jim turned his attention to the conversation and ran a few equations before nodding slightly. Possibly. Martin did have a tracker on him when he... Well, you know. He must have expected this would happen. I looked towards Natalie, still trying to come to terms with everything, as Caleb set up a plan. We can move all the equipment we need to the camper and use it to head for the beacon, Jim. Jim, you can coordinate from there. Hold on, hold on. Y you're seriously thinking about going out there again? We barely had a chance to even... Recuperate. If we don't go now, the signal might be lost, and this time for good. We don't know how long that particular beacon will last. Jim, what do you say? Could that work? Caleb asked, turning back to the stout man. Theoretically, yes, he said as the hunter clapped his hands excitedly. But I think I need to be the one out there. I built the beacon, so I'm more familiar with how it works. Okay, sure, fine. You can go, Trapper said dismissively. Hold on! Olivia said, raising her hands and looking towards her father. We need to think this through. Who's staying here to man the station? And more importantly, without Martin, who will handle the camera equipment? The old man pursed his lips together, considering all the alternatives, and then muttered, I think it'll need to be you, my dear. You know this place inside and out. Olivia looked like she wanted to object, but didn't say a word about that, instead focusing on the issue of equipment. You'll need a driver and someone else to help with the setup. Jim can't handle it all. Ken looked at me. I knew exactly what he was thinking. I can run the camera, I decided. All right, then. Looks like I'm the driver, Caleb said excitedly, getting ready to leave the room. Not so fast, Mr. Kenny declared as he leaned on his crutch and then jabbed a finger towards the hunter. You're a much better gun than anyone else here, Mitchum. That means that you'd be better suited to stay here and protect my daughter in case those things come back for round two. The trapper looked offended that he wouldn't be able to go, but instead of arguing, he remarked, Okay, then who do you suggest as a driver? Kearney looked towards Natalie. The blonde's mouth gaped open. Me, sir? You said yourself you wanted to do field duty. This is your chance. I didn't bother putting my two cents in. I knew they wouldn't listen anyway. Instead, I turned to Caleb and said, I'll help you load up the camper. Hey guys, I just want to make sure that all of you take a look in the description down below for multiple different reasons. The main reason I'm talking about right now, though, is to look at the author's links. Every time that I do a story on one of these platforms, I post links from the authors. Some of them are books that the authors put out. If you like the stories that you hear, then I highly, highly encourage you to go scroll down, take a look in the description, click one of those links. If you like that author, I guarantee you they have something else that you're going to like. And if they have a book out there, you're going to love that book. I mean, hell, that's how Tales from the Gas Station became what it is, okay? If you guys heard it on YouTube, then hey, there are more, bigger, better versions of it out there that you can get on Amazon or Audible or No Sleep or what have you. So for real, uh, the, scroll down, check out the links. And that's not like an advertisement thing. I'm just like, look, you're, this is for your benefit. Check it out. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. Thank you so much. A very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Reaper61167, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krauss, Vicky McQuickie, Sam High, Crusader Chocobo, Spooky Shell, Adam Maros, Grand Moth the Milky, Big Smoke 369, Captain Scurvy, Salty Irish Poet, Esteban, Raiden Morris, Nate Cull, Horror Fan 1212, Hour Minute Second Time, Kyle Resnack, David Martin, Scarrington the Unkempt, Robert Malcolm, Angelus, Spanky, Snoochie Boochie, Seclude, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Merxenum, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Catabaker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Spiolinian, Xavier Graphius, Lord Life's Best, Goring Tramagasy, Maria Walker, Emily Mitchell, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Eka Limchok, Dirt Diver 03, 
Trio, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Hidden Tiger, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Psychomel, Nana, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Titanic Aries, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Sazaku, Cronut 509, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Benjamin Welverett, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Raphael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so, so much because you guys help me do everything that I do here. You guys help pay authors for stories and commission stories and do everything that I can do to make this channel and make this podcast a- a- the best it could possibly be. So thank you all for supporting me here. And as always, everyone, sweet dreams. <laughs>